Uh, hello, my name is Henry Fleming, and as part of the Spark Animation Festival 2022, um, I have the honor of um, having a conversation with two uh, fantastic artists and animators, and who happen to be very old friends of mine, Wendy Tilby and Amanda Forbus, who are joining us from their home studio in Calgary. Hello. 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 Uh, Hello. So, so um, they've just finished a uh, much anticipated film, The Flying Sailor, which recently um, premiered at Annecy. Um, but before um, I talk about that, which I really want to ask you uh, many questions about, um, I'd like for those of you who may not know, I don't know who wouldn't know, but who don't know about uh, Wendy and Amanda and their background and their fabulous work, I'd like to um, introduce. Uh, I'd like to introduce some of their film works and also how we know each other, um, right? So uh, I went to. Um, oh, it's all about me. I went to Emily <laughs> Carr because because I was uh, I was inspired. I was inspired by this film that I saw uh, by Martin Rose called Study of an Apartment, and I went and I got an interview with Hugh Folds, who was the animation instructor at the time, and uh, he was totally not impressed with any of the work that I showed him or what I was saying. You, you know, he basically said, thank you for coming by. Would you like to see our grad show? And in that grad show, there was tables of content or content, as some people like to say, by Wendy Tilby. And I, it was paint on glass. I'd never seen anything like this. I was so excited. I wrote a letter to Hugh saying, oh my God, this film has changed my life. And based on my letter, he let me into the program. Really? And, uh, huh? I said, really? Uh, well, great. Must have been a hell of a good letter. Well, that's what he told me. He also tried to kick me out a year later. Anyway, um, and also <laughs> that's where I, uh, so I understand that Wendy had originally uh, started off interested in documentary filmmaking. Is that correct? Yeah, that, I, that's, I, I think I had had an epiphany after going to university and I traveled for a year where I kind of thought, oh my God, um, filmmaking is the way I can combine all these interests that I have in art or writing or science. And, and I thought, well, I don't have to be any of those things. I can make films about these subjects that I like. So I kind of thought filmmaking, but I thought documentary would be it. And I also liked the idea of um, gathering stuff and re sort of responding to information that you gather and making something out of it rather than starting from scratch. But that changed when I went to Emily Carr because I kind of got seduced by the animation department and the solitude of making a film like an animated film and having all that control. So um, that's, I just ended up with a grad film in animation. And it was sort of similar for Amanda actually. Yeah, well, Amanda, because we were in at Emily Clark at the same time, and you started off in the live action section, and then you landed up making Box Pig. Yeah, which is which I couldn't find that. It on the web. I couldn't find it on the web. It should be on the web. It should be. Yeah, there. it should be. It should Thank be you. right. Um, which so was uh, which was which was paper. Which was uh, paper stop motion. That's right. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 And I, I was just thinking that your two. Um, your two first films. I mean, the music, of course, Box Pig was Bach, but uh, for Tables of Content, it was Schumann, right? That's right, yeah. So there you go, already you're having a musical conversation with your films. And we were both working under camera too, which is sort of a seat of the pants kind of animation uh, that I think, well, I think it gave us sort of some uh, sympathy with each other and how we work, but also it also meant that neither of us was very well versed in real animation. Right. <laughs> or you, kind of you like, know, the paper, yeah. the drawing yeah. on paper crowd. Yeah. I mean, they were your classmates. You were with them every day. They were yeah. doing their drawn thing. They're drawn either it's kind of cells and paper and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we were, yeah. we were showing their chops. We, yeah. we were not interested in showing chops. I, yeah. I, I assume you felt the same way. Indeed, I did. <laughs> and your film, your film, the, what was it? Was it Drowning? What waving. Was it? Waving. Waving. <laughs> right, sorry. 
Um, no, it's from Stevie yeah. Smith's poem, though. Not waving. Yes, yeah, that's why I made the mistake. But yeah. that was one of my. That's one of my all-time favorite yeah. student films. I just I was gobsmacked by that. Thought it was a wonderful. Yeah, you inspired both of film. us. With yeah, that one. Well, and it, it should because it was about death, and it seems that a lot of your stuff <laughs> is. We'll get into that later. <laughs> oh, yeah. sure. So, so the reason why you should know these people. Uh, besides the fact that they're, they're amazing artists is that they've won like every award ever and they've been nominated for several um, academy awards and in 2018 um, at the annies you were uh, given a windsor mckay award for your contribution to animation like yeah. what yeah that's what we thought what like what <laughs> <laughs> we thought are we that old? That's but, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lifetime um, achievement award, and we thought, no, we whoa, whoa, whoa. But, yeah, uh, so we felt like okay, we've got some work to do to live up to that one. Yeah, yeah. it was very nice, but uh, still kind of surprises us, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to tie you guys together, you're both from Alberta, but you met at Emily Carr, and yep. then after um, after Emily Carr. You made that little Sesame Street thing, Wendy. That was great. Which I loved. Yeah. The dog, it's from over the dog chewing. I forgot about that one. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. About... Everything you've done is seared on my mind. I'm not stalking you. Um, <laughs> and so then Wendy went to Montreal to work at the NFB and work on Strings, a, a film that seemed like a diptych actually for me with tables of content now that I've rewatched them. Yeah, I think I agree. Yeah. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, the same character at the table is mm. obviously the the guy in the apartment below. Um, anyway, anyway, yeah. it's really hard to talk about your film, like any one film, because they all seem to be having a conversation with each other, you know? Like, there's so many of the same themes, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Amanda left school and immediately uh, worked as a bicycle repair person at Reckless Rider. That. That's right, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, and so that was a year. Right. A strange year, that memorable year. Right. Before you were convinced that perhaps your talents were best used in animation. Well, actually, I, you know, the uh, the director of the, uh, so I ended up working on a, uh, an animated uh, five, six part series called The Reluctant Deckhand, and they had actually asked me to do it uh, mm -hmm. pretty soon after I graduated but then of course it took them a while to get moving so in that year I filled my time by working at the bike shop oh I see you were waiting you were yeah. just waiting yeah you were spinning your wheels so to speak <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> also also what these guys have in common is they love a pun like you got so <laughs> many puns in your films I love them um okay so yeah, yes you mean visual puns and visual yeah. Visual well, plus. Because Amanda gives me a hard time about puns because I love puns. Um, and sometimes she well, you know pretends to not like you know them. the groaners where, yeah. where you just wish the person hadn't said it because it I don't know it's it's the funny thing I mean a really good pun is irreplaceable, but there's so many where you just think, oh god, oh, you know, and I just you know move more towards low humor of the low humor of sarcasm. <laughs> so but you know, we all like that, right? I mean, who doesn't like sarcasm? We 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 love it. I know people <laughs> tell me how much they love my humor. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. it. so, but but this is interesting too because you worked on. I made so many notes, and I wish I could find them. Uh, but yeah, you. I mean, you also worked on um, Joe, right? Oh yeah. Actually, you know what? Maybe I'm telling a bit of a. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a fib because Joe came first. In no, okay, no, what for came first was Toronto to Belleville. Toronto on... to Belleville, but Toronto to Belleville was also last because it took a long time to make. <laughs> right, so right. I worked on Toronto to Belleville. Yeah, that that but... was with Martin Rose, and that was based on um, Earl Burney's poem. That's right. When he was uh, going to meet um, that other poet. He was going, Earl Burney was... Oh, yeah, he was going to meet, who was it? Uh, Alperti, Alperti? Uh, might have been Alperti. Yeah. Let's, let's say Alperti. Let's, let's just say, say it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I worked on that and then I transitioned into the Relicton Deckhand. And then some years later, quite a bit later, I, I worked on Joe. Joe, which was um, Jill Harris. And yeah. it's funny because the work that you've, you guys have done together, like 
wildlife, like the flying sailor. It's all part of Canadiana, of Canadian history. And a lot of it happened in the early 20th century. Like yeah. that's, it seems to be, I was thinking, oh my God, there's like a West Coast animation movement that is about, you know, retelling, um, you know, reinterpreting these uh, stories from, um, from our early yeah history. it's you know that's certainly uh, it, it really looks that way but that certainly was never our you know we never said okay we're gonna sit down and do Canadiana you know it just happened that these two stories we found very attractive for I think different reasons but and then it ends up looking like you you are obsessed with Canadiana but there is that aesthetic of around 1910 that's really great you know yeah. I, I mean in the flying sailor the ships oh I just love that stuff I love the you know but we sort of went out of our way a little bit to avoid naming Halifax or the explosion um explicitly in the, in the until, the, until the end you know well, you did, you yeah. did um <laughs> your, yeah. your first the first text that we read says that it is a true story right yeah about this you know this one particular sailor who, with a name <laughs> uh, we only say that we only say this name and who he is at the end oh is it we say a true yeah. story we say a true story true. which at the point in the film when we say true story we we know it will be read as or we hope it will be read as something a little bit cheeky because here's this um sailor flying through the air in slow motion um and he's about what with his hundred feet of, in the air or something clothes like coming off and everything like that and it's a true story and it is a true story but um it's not that true but it's it's sort of um the point is not the history the point is his experience yeah really but the history certainly adds um i mean we have, we've actually found people are way more interested in the history than we expected them to be where they what this really happened and yeah. it did really happen but of course we've completely made up the, the story but the the fact of it is true yeah mm -hmm. but it's interesting i'm jumping around a bit but yeah. of course no, we're, we're, but oh, we're, <laughs> we led you there we led you there <laughs> because because i i from my um research I, I understand that you came upon this story first when you're at the halifax maritime museum when you were there with when date when the day breaks that's yeah. right and, yeah. and of course of course that's where all the ephemera from the titanic lives yeah. and the titanic uh features yeah. very strongly in strings right yeah so it's like this True. Uh, yeah right like it's this little world that all all hooks up together. And Titanic um, was my my high school true love. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there we can have this um, photocopy, yeah. color photocopy from. Wow. Well, and that of course was inspired by Amanda uh, long before we worked together, but we were very good friends, and and her love of everything to do with the Titanic. Yeah. This is I yeah. hasten yeah. to add. This is before the James Cameron movie. It was even yeah. before when I fell in love with the Titanic it was before they even found it. So it was about 1915 that I fell in love with the Titanic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but yeah. wow. Yeah, so the, the, the movie would have killed my affection for it. You know, I have I have a Titanic story. Oh, do my, you? Yeah, uh, The Magical Life of Long Tight Sam, my great grandfather, right? Yes. They had returned tickets back from New York that they didn't get to use. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a story. All right. That's something else. Um, okay, wait, that totally threw me off my Wendy and Amanda game. Oh, right, yeah. Right. So, so, so you're making so strings does very well, you complete that it gets nominated for Academy Award and blah, 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 all these amazing things. Um, and then you're making uh, when the day breaks, and you 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 can completely correct me if I am saying something wrong. But you um, you need help, and you call you call Martin and Amanda to come out and help you with both your cre your creative process and also to help animate. Well, I mean you can't separate them. Um, is that is that yeah I, I hit a, a kind of a wall I think um the idea was there but the what it was um how to make it and I was I definitely like I wanted to depart from the under camera thing um because of its um well I do, partly because I don't like to repeat myself but 
also because I just thought I needed to expand. It would be fun to work with someone. Um, and I just didn't quite know how to get past that. And also because I, I always, I felt really unskilled in terms of animation because of having only done paint on glass and all that sort of thing. But so my two creative soulmates really were Martin and Amanda, but they, they actually didn't come out to Montreal. I, I think I went to Vancouver and where we corresponded and, and they, they, I think, were probably you were given small contracts I think to do some yeah. drawings and stuff like that and they and they were uh uh very inspiring I don't and, remember them I don't remember what we did anyway yeah well and then in the end um Amanda came out to Montreal and then Martin did continue and he did do um some work on the film he did the um uh, the black and white sequences. So, yeah, it's almost like mechanical drawings yeah. through the sewer and the uh, beautiful, beautiful yeah. drawings. Beautiful drawings. So beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And I wish yeah. that there were there was a way to include in the film all of his planning drawings. Because if you, as you know, Anne Marie, if you if you know Martin, that <laughs> his stuff that he I mean, on Toronto to Belleville, the the work that he does in planning the film, like all the little so beautiful um guides <laughs> like cut out guides and little protractors that shows the increments and all that sort of thing gorgeous are so beautiful yeah. i mean he just it, all those things should be displays you know and i think i think those things um are probably in a way more fun for him than the making of the film and you know we have a lot of those drawings from when the day breaks that he did of all the planning it's all very tidy and but anyway, that's a digression. But uh, he he contributed a very some very valuable stuff, and and but Amanda came to Montreal, and we ended up uh, so she jumped into the trenches with me, and um, and it was it was great. So obviously we've continued the collaboration, but um, we well one of the the big things was that we were um, uh, the just just from working on my basically the story was just like a one page treatment and um i was doing these really naive characters and, and amanda was doing these drawings and stuff we were kind of struggling with it but in the margins we were always doing all these little sketches of critters and which is as we are wont to do it I mean, just sort of love little animals and stuff like that and then there was one day we just said like let's just make the goddamn animals it's way more fun you know and th and then that was kind of a a big shift because it became less um dark i guess the story was darker yeah. and then um and then the in conjunction with that the whole uh, video printer idea became a way to incorporate animals um, in the video and all that and that that sort of that worked for me in a way because I always like responding to something um, I mean when I was talking about documentary that's sort of what I mean like I like shooting something and I don't even know why I'm shooting it but then bring it in and then make a figure out what you're making and the video printing was a way to do that was to have not the blank page but the all these photographs to work with and this um uh yeah these these images that informed the story i guess but that would anyway i don't know if you want us to go in a, on about the technique of when the day breaks well but, not not yet yeah that's that's yeah, I, yeah. because i was going to say yeah. that um the other thing was the, the, music. the musical idea yeah. turning it into a musical mm -hmm. and those really were a product of the fact that we were having fun and that we clearly needed to have more fun within the film itself and that those those ideas gave it a, a lift and an inspiration that it, it had not had that had up to that point and then it was much more of a pleasure to make <laughs> Oh, 
Well, it does have a very um, American in Paris feel when, when she falls <laughs> off that, that, that foot on the chair. Right, right. <laughs> it's so lovely. But uh, yeah, and it, and it sets up this lightness for the, um, the tragedy that's about to happen. So there, it's always that nice play of light and dark. And, um, but uh, yeah, music, you know, um, I read also somewhere that wildlife was your first uh, foray into to dialogue but in some ways um the lyrics for uh the song that martha wainwright sings for when the day breaks uh was very much a part of the storytelling do you want to talk yeah, about that yeah that's true you talk i'm gonna let yeah. the dog out okay um well the i remember um the 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 title when the day breaks came about right around when i can't remember if it was before or after no i guess it was right when we thought we would make it a musical and um i guess that's a yes another pun isn't it <laughs> but but it was but i i remember it kind of just coming to me in a flash that oh yes that's what this is about because that is our sort of a preoccupation um the this those moments in life when everything changes and um there's it becomes before and after and so that 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 was very pivotal and then because we had been listening to and trying and working with a lot of um depression era songs from the 30s um just that those kinds of life is a bowl of cherries and um then there was one uh roll along prairie moon which sort of informed the second or the third song called prairie blue um we we the lyrics were written uh in order to be definitely of that era so they were they were not meant to stand out as being um large in terms of content or or that uh to to express something really deep but they were to express something a, a mood and um and of mourning and everything's great and but of course the the day breaking has a the, the double entendre which um plays out in the rest of the film so we want we didn't want the lyrics to stand out in any way we wanted people to just accept them as this kind of song that that yeah inspiration you know dennis potter's the singing detective right. was yeah, a yeah, yeah. profound yeah. inspiration i you know at, pennies at, from heaven yeah, yeah at the point we saw that film it was the best piece of tv that had ever existed you know and uh, was just so mind-blowing and it, it was very informative for us hmm. Hmm. um well do you talk about the double entendre, you have tables of content, you have strings, which is the strings that are being plucked and also the strings between people. And, and in and these three films so far, we have these interstitial moments, right? Where you've got the quotidian of life that's passing by while people are on their own little desperate journeys, you know, whether it's right, a yeah. car accident yeah. or a bad date, right? It's like, how do you fill these times? Of, and the same, the same characters come out like, the fish and the lemon or the you know the sort you know like the the can of something or the milk like the same characters are all like they've got cameos in all your films you know and Do you know um, what another one is is um little jam filled cookies yes <laughs> oh my god the jam filled cookies we didn't fit that into the flag i know we should to have, our regret we should have no, I, I was trying to research it to ask you questions and i was like oh my god I, i'm writing like a, an english essay about that you know, was pretty good words. <laughs> the metaphors in the, the words of Kilby Forbes. And, that was pretty um, good. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so so you finish that film. I just I just want to be aware of time and, and so we can spend some time on the flying sailor. But uh, but then I understand uh, I actually know some of these answers, but I think I'm supposed to ask questions. Right. So yeah. what was your um, 
what was your inspiration for your next film, Wildlife? Well, that was a, an idea that I had had some years earlier. Actually, somebody we both know, Michelle Bjornsson, uh, was talking to me one day at the Film Board in Vancouver about this concept of remittance men, and, and I had never heard of them. And <clears throat> I was quite interested in these sort of forgotten figures on the landscape. And uh, then I went home and I said to my dad, have you ever heard of remittance men? And he said, oh, sure, your mother's family was full of them. <laughs> which is funny. And then, you know, long afterwards, I realized that it, it was a very personal film for both of us in the sense that we both had grandparents who tried to farm out here and they just got their asses walloped. kicked, frankly. They got, they got walloped. Mm -hmm. And that, that, you know, then that becomes part of your DNA and you don't think about it and you end up making a film about it. But we were interested in it uh, also because, it, you know, in a way it's like the inverse to when the day breaks where there's a character experiencing isolation in the city there is a character f in wildlife from the city who is comfortable presumably comfortable in the city who then experiences real isolation and for me i always think it comes out of the anxiety about uh adaptation you know are you are you going to be ready for for life as it comes at you or do you have are you equipped to face a new context for your life and um i don't know if everybody has that anxiety but i certainly do well it's um it's interesting just as an aside that the letter that he writes and, and i guess maybe you want to explain to people who don't know what a remittance man actually is right. uh it's a they were englishmen uh usually from the aristocracy who they they were often what they called second sons so they weren't going to inherit the estate and a number of the professions that they had been entitled to like you know the ministry or or um the army the, the army in particular or the military started requiring skills so they couldn't just go into the military and so they had these second sons sitting around the the estates and this 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 is way more high flown than wendy's or my family i want to be clear about that we're not aristocracy but um they, they had nothing to do, so they just drink and gamble and get in trouble, all kinds of trouble, which nobody knows what the trouble was, because of course English people don't speak about those things. So they sent them off to the colonies to make men of them. And so then these boys came out to these prairies, you know, this just ridiculously difficult landscapes, and they larked around and, and then they, uh, they sometimes died in extravagant ways and uh, never, most of them didn't achieve much. And, and most of them were called up to the First World War and never came back again. But, you know, for a little while, there was this kind of sparkle amongst all of these sort of hard, you know, people who are used to a hard life and they lived hard life. And, and suddenly there are these boys there, they, they play polo and they, you know, they buy the entire bar a drink on their monthly check that they got from dad at home, the remittance from dad. So that's kind of where, who those guys were. Dear mother and father, happy news. I have secured for myself 90 acres of prime ranch land, which to my delight has upon it an absolutely wizard ranch house. I'm writing this letter from my veranda and I'm very pleased with my situation. I believe I may now call myself a rancher. Oh, give me a ranch and a big pair of pants and give me a Stetson too and let me wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. Englishmen they end up out here with a whole lot of dollars and no sense. They're wonderful dancers, but I certainly wouldn't marry one of them. We put a sign in the window. No credit extended to Englishmen. It's our policy. They never pay their bill. Give me the wide open spaces. I'm just like a prairie flower, growing wilder every hour. Oh, give me a moon, the prairie moon, and give me a gal that's true, and let me walk, walk, walk. Well, what struck me, um, it, it seems, um, it seems dissociative, but the letter that he's writing home to his uh, mama and papa about telling them what a great time he's having and how successful he's being. I mean, I've seen documentaries about. Uh, migrants in um who go to europe and even though completely different situations they're escaping poverty they're trying to you know start a new life for right. themselves 
but they don't want to tell a bad story. So they're sending back these letters about how they've, you know, they've made it, you know, yeah. so nobody will ever know what they're suffering and yeah. keeping this myth alive, you know? Yeah. But I, I think that um, the, the text that is in um, wildlife, we talk about the comet, what a bits of, you know, um, ice and particles that never quite formed a planet, um, that that, that is just a segue straight into the flying sailor. Very good, yes. <laughs> right, like it's this, it's the, you know, in the, in wildlife, you see the snow and then the snow becomes the cosmos, right? And, um, and I was wondering, is this an, well, I mean, it was that particular moment when you were in the Halifax Museum, apparently, according to your other interviews. <laughs> Lies, yes, all yeah. lies. <laughs> but uh, but I'm just wondering, did you guys see that the the connection? Like it? No. Uh... Well, it, not until we were. <laughs> I'll tell you, all the way through production on the Flying Sailor, one of us would stop up and say, "Oh my God, this is too much!" Like, oh, we just did this in wildlife, or this is like. When the day breaks, we're just repeating it. We're just making the same thing over again. You know, it's kind of like when you were talking about the this when the day breaks, this sort of jaunty beginning, and then pff, everything changes. I mean, that's exactly what's happening in the Flying yeah. Sailor. The day is broken again, and then the the whole celestial thing. I mean, when we were intrigued by the the story in the Halifax Museum, we didn't we we weren't really thinking it through. We just knew we just had that idea, and we put it on the back burner. Uh, because we had this idea before wildlife, actually. Yeah. So we just knew that that was an idea that was interesting. And then it wasn't until we dug into it. And then we we knew that it related to when the day breaks, because the whole sequence of the the chicken's life strewn out on the road mm -hmm. and, um, the ca and the camera kind of rising up and it becoming a surreal uh, montage. Um, we knew that that was kind of a jumping off point for the flying sailor that there was something okay totally. you know now now we're now we're talking about the experience of the death itself or the near death um but this whole celestial thing well i mean i've always loved outer space um visually and and i mean i've always been intrigued by it um um for i don't know what reason but so I think we we kind of knew that we wanted the sailor to go into outer space, but we weren't thinking about wildlife. But the I think in wildlife, the the remittance man's religious experience, he's an atheist, but his religious experience at the point of death was seeing the comet. And so that was kind of a um, uh, a moment of grace, I guess, that he has. And so in, in all of our thinking about near-death experiences, that, that was, of course, going to figure in. I mean, we wanted him, he's being blasted up, 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 up. Of course, he's got to go into outer space, and then the outer space becomes his near-death experience and his uh, white light and, and, and his moment of bliss and all that kind of thing. So, I mean, they just, they relate. I mean, they're both death experiences. Yeah, also, sure. yeah. you know, the, the, you're right in that the comet does relate directly in the sense that, um, it, you know, there are those lines about how they were seen as a portent of evil and, and sort of ascribed all this power. And, yeah. and then yet they're just a, 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 a collection of ice and dust. And so thus saying, you know, that an Englishman on the prairies used to be uh, an intimidating figure or you know the, it, the Brit in Canada was an intimidating figure but here's this poor hapless boob who's just as much a, a victim of vampire as anybody and he just goes and he dies out there by himself his little life you know his little life is just nothing really and that the it's the same with the sailor in the sense that it you know we were careful to when we show his memories that there, you don't see anything of significance you certainly can't piece together a some kind of profound narrative of an extraordinary life. It's just a, it's just a life, you know, it just has little bits in it. Yeah, the quotation that, of life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that he's afforded this, this uh, moment of sort of, you know, what, melding with the cosmos, you know, that he, that he is allowed in that, in that moment to become extremely significant. And if, if not to anyone but himself, mm -hmm. and it's kind of the same with, with the remittance man that they have this, beautiful cosmic moment.
Well, I'm going to make a, a point, which I hope makes me sound very intelligent. And then I want to ask you an art question. Okay. And, oh, very. Um, so, <laughs> let's, here it goes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so um, one of the, the motifs that um, I saw working back working backwards like in the is that you have portals everywhere right in the um in the flying sailor you've got i believe it's a periscope where you see the waves through a periscope it could be a periscope or it could be a a ship's portal uh, yeah. portal yeah right and then i mean um you know going back to to strings you've got the portal is really um going up into her drain her broken drain Right, and you've got the same drain, got the same broken drain in um, when the day breaks, right? And it's this, it's this, it's this intimacy between what you know and what you don't know that connects people. Like there's this mystery between that and this. Like there's a distance to go in between, you know, and that all of all of existence lives there in this unknown bit. We should get her to talk about our. Yeah. <laughs> We should well, talk about our work. That was good. That's good. <laughs> it's so interesting, Henri, because um, when we when we just did the little talk in Annecy about um, the flying sailor, we were talking about how we well, see behind us our wall is full of images, and there are more over here. So we just constantly have images, and we put them up there, whether they have anything to do with the film or not. We just things that are attracting us. And a lot of things that went up were circles and dots mm -hmm. and circles and dots and it became portals and, and um, yeah. blobs and galaxies and, and, galaxies and, and particles of life and all that, those things in, in the flying sailor. Um, but we've never really connected it to the previous films. Like, of course, the sewer, the sewer drain is a portal and um, but what's interesting is that in when the day breaks, the um, the interface between the characters in their apartments, like the Ruby the pig in her apartment, and all the other characters in their places that are connected by plugs or drains or all that, that we had always thought of as sort of exactly what you're saying: this interface between what we know and what we don't know, and the the mystery behind the walls. Um, and what goes on under a street that you don't even think about until somebody starts digging it up and they jackhammer and you go, oh my God, their guts of the city are down there. That's, you know, I'm not supposed to see that. That's that's sort of like, it is like seeing a surgery or something where you go, you're not supposed to see the innards of a body or so that, you know, there was this connection between the insides of the city and the insides of what a body is made up of. And that's kind of been a preoccupation, I guess, in, um, in, well, a, bit, a little bit the flying sailor as well, but but you're right. Like a portal is between what I mean. Is that how you said it? You said it better. But between what we know and the mystery behind the wall. Yeah, but even just as that um, that portal for the ship that we have in Flying Sailor, you've got the same one in Tables of Content when the waiter leaves the kitchen and all the steam comes out and he comes out with his dish. It's the same portal. My God, I never would have thought of that. No, I tell you, I've, I've studied this. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, so just, oh, just a question that it just occurred to me, that comet, that very stylized comet you made, is that a reference to Blake? No, it's a, it's a reference to both um, Patterson Ewan, you know, the oh, yeah, great yeah, the yeah. Great yeah. And then his painting yeah. of the comet was a reference to Giotto. So it's a reference of a reference. Oh, fantastic. Because yeah. what I want to ask you now is what are your, uh, you know, your artistic influences? I, I understand um, that uh, you like the aesthetic of austerity. <laughs> not as a, yeah, not, not politically, but, but well, austerity, you mean like um, sort of economy of means, something like that. I mean, we, we're, we're always fairly careful. Yeah, what to... do you mean by that? Um, um, well, what what did I read? <laughs> um, uh, you were talking about, I guess, uh, I mean, obviously, early influences for paint on film was, you know, the work of Carolyn Leaf, right? Um, uh, I, 
I read that literarily um, you you went to the work of um, Wallace Steger about living on oh. the prairies. Like oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, the, but, yeah. And that you liked the work of Mera Kelma. Yeah, Kelman. Kelman. Yeah. Right. Kelman. Yeah, that's right. She, yeah, she, well, she's, she's for wildlife in particular. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, and the austerity, we wanted to capture the austerity of the prairies and how brutal they are and how, uh, well, austere. It's <laughs> almost yeah. to it. But and, if, if you mean aesthetically as opposed to, like, I don't think we work austerely. No, but, but we're, we yeah. sort of limit palettes a lot. You know, I mean, yeah. when the day breaks, it's a very limited palette. I mean, um, yeah. This one left some flying. It's very, even in chaos, it's very disciplined. Your work is very disciplined. I don't know if you know that. Really? Yeah. Oh, because oh, I I think of it as um, no, it comes out disciplined. Cha chaotic. Well, it is chaotic, um, but it is about finding order in yeah. that. And then, but I think the flying sailor, um, we've come to realize that it. I mean, it, there's no fad on that one at no. all. Like well, well, yeah. well, what's interesting is like all your other films have this meditational quality or moment, right, where we spend some time just watching and right, and and that becomes all of the flying sailor. It's that yeah. right that, that it's like saying um, this is what we're really interested in. Right. This is all the, the other films were just an excuse so that we could make these yeah. moments. You well, know? you know, we, <laughs> that's true. we, uh, that's so true. We were really struck by how much more pleasurable it was to do the voyage. You know, that, that, that weirdly was easy compared to just setting the damn thing up so that you see the ships in the harbor, you see the sailor, you see the dynamite, you set the story up. That was agony, you know, all that fussing about, oh, are we crossing the line? And do we, you know, we should the Is camera clear be here? Yeah, here yeah. And all, just, and, and then once you got into the actual voyage, the way it opened up and, and released itself from kind of these narrative strictures was so much fun. Yeah, because really the film, the film was really his trip. And we just wanted to get the kind of expository stuff over as efficiently as we could. Um, but then, you know, it, it, it it was actually so hard. Well, it's like that, <laughs> you know, I, I yeah, would have written yeah. you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time thing, you know, where you're trying to yeah. get right. it as lean as possible. And of course, it's well, through, yeah. miserable. But you did, you did, you did end that on a gag. Yes. What, with the dynamite? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Glad you saw it as a gag. <laughs> I mean, not the not the dynamite. The well, yeah, but the the match stick, right? Oh, it was like it was so classic, Bugs Bunny, right? It was you know this happened, and then oh, what about this? You know, well, do you know the um, the whole uh, well, the you know the TNT? We thought, well, how can you resist a Bugs Bunny reference? And plus, we wanted the beginning to be. Uh, we were obviously referring to cartoons again, lighthearted, lighthearted, light and everything like that. Unserious. And then, and then um, but then there's sort of this relates to when the day breaks as well. Is that there is something about this, you know, the sailor uh, when he lights his cigarette, and then the moment he strikes his match, or no, the moment the the, the match reaches the cigarette, the boat lights on fire, and. And then when he extinguishes the match, there, the relationship I'm talking about is that there is some weird sense of I caused this, you know, which, yeah. which is a yeah. weird, I mean, it's totally not rational. And I don't even know if anybody would pick that up, but there's something but it's about like with, the, it's like the butterfly effect. Exactly, exactly. Like, yeah, chaos, you know, but the, but in, in when the day breaks, there was for me anyway, like when the, the pig, her milk has gone off. She's going to the, um, the store. She bumps into the chicken. She goes in and he gets hit by a car and she feels implicated. I mean, it's sort of that implication in this terrible thing. And so the sailor somehow, it's just something that implicates him. It, it also, more. it yeah. gives you, it gives him an inner life because up to that point, he's not the guy who's inviting you in to his world. You know, he's, he's quite, impassive and, right yeah and so then, and then this gives you just a little hint of of something else in him 
Well, in the cigarette, I mean, it's obviously a bit of business. And then um, the other gag, you know, being that, it, it, I mean, it's still lit at the end. Um, um, and, you know, and it's sort of also meant to be a, a clock in a way that shows us that actually very, almost no time has elapsed in this five minutes that you've been watching it. Um, it's actually just a few seconds. And I don't know if that's something obvious, but maybe in subsequent views, people will kind of get that, that this was really only a few seconds of, of his life. You know, another uh, influence, an influence on Flying Sailor was definitely um, Betty Goodwin, the, the painter, but you know, another handy CanCon yeah. moment, uh, Betty Goodwin is fantastic. And Do you know those paintings? Of, uh, there are these figures. Yeah. They're just so beautiful. And these sort of vulnerable mm -hmm. bodies that sometimes appear to be floating or drowning or something like that was definitely, you know, definitely informed the feeling we want, wanted for the sailor in the air. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's a good uh, time for me to ask you to talk a little bit about technique in Flying Sailor. Well, um, so it became pretty clear that if we wanted to uh, blow down hundreds of houses, uh, while panning over the landscape that this was not something we would do in 2D animation. <laughs> we just couldn't face it. So we, we decided we should use a CG uh, CG style for, for that and also for the prologue. Well, we were inspired by live action archival footage that we had put in our animatic yeah. as a stand-in. But we just couldn't have done it. We couldn't have animated it by and, hand. Yeah, yeah so, so then the trick was to, to try to use a, a, a certain slightly naive um, uh, CG look without it uh, reporting itself as a naive CG look because you know that's can be quite horrible. And then the uh, sailor himself, we, we really wanted him to be to be more 2D, you know, because he's our boy, you know, and that's our world is is the 2D. I think, you know, we were just yeah. more comfortable with yeah. him that way. And, and he could be more what we would consider aesthetically pleasing even though he's not an especially aesthetically pleasing man. But <laughs> um, anyway, and then also, uh, you know, when we were um, putting the animatic together, we were using lots of live action, just throwing in stock shots and uh, different things, different bits that we'd shot. And we liked the way it worked in there. And so the, you know, there's the occasional live action shot, like a seagull or, or something like that. And we didn't feel any kind of a contradiction in it. It didn't feel uncomfortable in there. So we, we hung on to that. So it's kind of a, it's a, almost a little bit collage-y in, in, you know, it's got several different components to the style in it. Well, um, it's funny, uh, the, the sailor who loses all his clothes, it feels like that's, um, something that was also building through all your films, right? Like, <laughs> no, so like, I mean, he's been dying to get those clothes off. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting because it's this, it's this intimacy, right? It's this intimacy. And so like for strings, for example, the woman takes off her, she takes off her house coat. We don't see her mm -hmm. naked, but then she, she's in water. She gets out of the water. She puts on her house coat, the man comes in and he, he fixes her bath, but but she's been in that water, right? The boat's been in the water, her body's been in the yeah. water, and now the man is fixing the water. And even though she's not naked, she's been naked. Right. And you have this vulnerability, right? right? And then with the house coat, what's with the house coats, uh, you know, in When Day Breaks, right? That's something that comes off yeah, and she's on. Like the the coat comes off, the coat comes on, right? It's, it's but, uh, but we still don't see any skin, even though they're animals, right? Right. And then the, the only thing that you see naked, oh my God, I should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> fish, like you've got fish in every single film, there's yeah. fish. And then of course, you've got the correlation between the man that, you know, the human and the fish and the flying, right. flying sailor. And I think it's like, um, it's, it's like when you see this disrobing, when you're just, when you're, yeah, like I, I thought it was just such a, an elegant way of showing um, that, uh, yeah, as like how do, that we're really part of the world. You've got this big, ungainly, un, you know, we don't want to say unattractive, <laughs> but okay. you know, naked beast floating through the cosmos, right? And he is just as perfect there as any dust particle or, or comet, you know? 
that um, I thought it was really beautiful. And, and I hope, um, I think we have to kind of close it up now, but, but I hope that if people listen to this whole thing, that they're really excited at going back and watching all of your other films, because I think they do tell a story. I think you guys are uh, on a journey. Well, that's, Thank that's you. really interesting, yeah. Emery. I, I've never made a lot of those connections. So that's, it's, this has been highly educational for us. Oh, and I have more connections. Wow. <laughs> wow. I have got more connections. But I think, uh, I think uh, I'm going to sort of end it here. Is, should I end it here, Keith? No? How has it been making, you know, this is a, you know, this is just a real life question. How has it been making in COVID? I know that, you know, we all work kind of hermetically and we've been able to not be that disrupted in our, you know, our, our digital worlds, but how, how has it been for you? I mean, you have the benefit of, of working together, right? So it's, a, you could never call what you do solitary, but. Right. Um, I think it was fine, hey? It I, mean, was, I mean, for us, because we were already working at home, we were, uh, it was actually a good way for us to focus. Um, I mean, I'm not saying the larger picture was good because it's not, you know, the COVID picture, but the, in terms of making this film, um, we were not impacted. Uh, I mean, it, we, we were in, this, we were supposed to finish well, yeah, it yeah. Um, in February, January of 2021. And, uh, and we decided, we thought we were just deciding this, but actually it turned out to be absolute necessity to just delay it and another year but we would not have been ready anyway we weren't even close to being being ready so it was a three-year schedule instead of two so that's one way well the film changed. board didn't really want to release it to online festivals and we didn't want them to we do didn't that want too. to and um so we were everybody was hopeful that 2022 would be better um and, in, you know in that regard but we definitely needed the extra time anyway yeah. so it as so COVID only really affected you on its um, premiere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Actually, it, it affected us too. We did hire a local guy named uh, Billy Dyer to work on the uh, CG stuff. And we, we were counting on getting together with him in the same room uh, over production. And that didn't happen. You know, we, but you know, we communicated on Slack and occasionally on Zoom and stuff anyway, but you know, we had hoped that that would have been a, a good thing to be able to get together with him more, but you know, so we weren't able to do that. Yeah, and we didn't, we didn't end up showing the film to a lot of people, which I think was a dangerous thing yeah. to do, you know, not to not get feedback. And I think it's okay. We're not entirely sure yet, but we think it was okay that we did that. But uh, that was, you know, certainly COVID related. You just didn't have people, you know, if you wanted to have people over for a screening, because you don't want to do that remotely and get them to write notes. It's not the same thing. You don't get the same kind of yeah. sense of what they think about the film. So, you know, we were possibly too hermetically sealed, probably. I think that that would be yeah. one thing. But we count ourselves as pretty lucky because we, we had something to do. You know, we weren't just sitting there twiddling our thumbs or not being at our real job. So we were, we counted ourselves very fortunate. Oh, hey, let's talk about the sound design, right? Okay. You start off with Gilbert and Sullivan and then um, Luigi Alamano. Am I saying his name correctly? Yeah. You don't um, mean Gilbert and Sullivan for The Flying Sailor. Gilbert and Sullivan was for Wildlife. Oh my goodness. Yeah. They are all one now. See, that's, that's one word. We thought, oh, we're just making the same yeah. stinking film. Oh, my it's ridiculous. But, yeah, Luigi's uh, score score is his was delightful. Yeah, he did he did a great yeah. job. He's he's a very uh, patient, 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 lovely man. <laughs> and we we it was a very difficult score that especially the initial uh, uh, from from the explosion on when you when you see the sailor in the air that particular piece that goes over him flying through the clouds and all the stuff flying by him it was just really really difficult to we when we thought of it as a we as a ballet in a way where we wanted we wanted that combination of beauty and 
terribleness at the same time. Tragedy. So, so we, you know, we wanted it to be that he's rising above this calamity and that the music to reflect that and to give, you know, his movements, this delicacy, but we didn't want it to just be that either. And it was sort of, and then it, it how it carries through all the, you know, the, the rest of it, the memories and the, yeah, it, it, it was, it was tough. It was a yeah, tough at, at some point we're having this magical, mysterious journey. It's delightful. It's whimsical. And then it isn't. And that's, I think, very much the sound plays into making that happen. So when he when he plummets back to Earth, um, so there was, it kind of, you know, it's sort of beautiful up to a point and then, but then the idea was that, um, well, often with near-death experiences is that there is a moment of, uh, you could call it decision, but this pivotal moment when people, they're they're they become one with you know they they lose their sense of their body their sense of their body's perimeter and um they they're they've left the pain and and sickness whatever that they <laughs> has caused this near death and they are feeling such bliss and they you know, they often see these dead relatives and you're beckoning them and they and the to die is really the easier choice the much more, more attractive more choice. desirable choice but something compels them to go back and so that's what we wanted to convey this when he comes hurtling back down to earth that it's all these mem the memories that he has are all of falling and slipping and crashing and banging and punching and so it's sort of it's life's bumps and and everything that that we're seeing as he goes down and and it's like it's it's like being yanked back to your body i guess if you're you know on the operating table or something like that and you and and going back to his body and to life um is really the much more difficult path because he's in the middle of a post um it doesn't look very explosion nice. and it's yeah. you know life is going to be very very hard and painful probably for him but but it's life and so it's a really uh ambivalent moment but anyway back to luigi the the piece he did for that was fantastic yeah. we, you know when he just really just bang, you know like um and if you, if you hear it in a theater in um atmos because it was mixed in um atmos which is Dolby on Super steroids. Fancy. Super it's kind fancy. of horrible in a way, but uh, it's like zillions of speakers and everything like that. But but it's um it's it's quite something, yeah. you know, that fallback and the the music that he did is great. We asked him to go full Russian on that. Wow. Well, yeah. well no, he did he did a stellar job. 